all the way up to 35. It's total. I mean, I don't think I think most of you, you may not be in science as such, but I should put wonder how in the world could that happen? How in the world we already know, for example, that diseases go up, serious diseases. Most of the deaths we die of prematurely are these diseases. Now they're saying we can go even higher, up to 35%. I have to say it's total nonsense, uh, but that's what we're living with. That is now in the registry. And uh, so we, there it is. Um, I call it mob power because I can't think of any other word that describes this. It's, it's basically a, 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 a representation by the uh, by the uh, dietary guidelines committee done by the Department of Agriculture in particular, uh, livestock industry. Somehow they got in there involved. I know how they got involved. I know personally how they got involved. I know what they did. I know very well, and I'm, I'm basically going to save that for another time, um, because it's a representation of how we, the public, have had to live with information that's not accurate. So here we are today. Um, where uh, and and I get as I say kind of depressed about this because I I found science to be very exciting going through the years as long as we you know did it like it was told we were supposed to do it you you, you can have different opinions that's great you can bring people with opposite points of view together have discussions out in the open at the end of the day you know we're we're subject to peer review uh, and uh, that's where it's been so I think we've been making progress but here all of a sudden just announced they were just about a week ago, I think it was, um, this new uh, new uh, report, 296-page report by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Now, for those of you who may not know, FAO is the agency of the United Nations that looks after agriculture, as it obviously says here. Okay, They came out with a report. Here's the title. It says, Contribution of Terrestrial Animal Source Food, that's animal food, uh, to healthy diets. Improved nutrition and healthcare. Now, I cannot uh, overstate the importance, the significance of this particular report. Coming on the heels of what I just showed you, coming on the heels of what I just showed you. Here's a very powerful agency, uh, sort of uh, in the business of uh, developing science, so to speak, for the uh, animal food industry. And this is worldwide. So it, it, it has an enormous audience around the world. It will become the sort of the standard. Uh, going along with the idea that, you know, we can eat a lot of animal protein and no problem, which is false. Um, so what did this uh, this chart show? I'm just showing you a couple, uh, in their key findings. Uh, and I'm quoting here exactly. Uh, they call it terrestrial animal source food or TSF. And these are actual quotes. And I'm putting some dots in the sentences here. weren't germane to what they said, but this is animal food here meat, milk, and eggs, if you will. It says it, it, it can make vital contributions to meet the global nutritional targets of 2025, endorsed by a couple other organizations, Wealth, World Health Assembly, and, and this, this group here, and it's aimed to reduce stunting among children under five. I can't, I just cannot find anything it's more, more offensive in a way by saying that sort of thing. That was the argument used way back in when I was working with this the stunted children, if you will, in the Philippines. And the study comes from the fact that these children in those poor countries, they basically didn't have enough food to begin with. That was a big thing. And secondly, they were exposed to a lot of infectious diseases at the time, being, you know, not very well, you couldn't handle that. And so, uh, and they had so-called stunning that went on into lifetime. So now they're talking about, uh, you know, using animal food to, to reduce stunting in the children, uh, as if that's what we're all supposed to do. Uh, this kind of food, too, prov provides higher quality proteins. This is sheer nonsense. I showed the data here that others don't seem to want to talk about. Uh, high quality protein, there is no such thing uh, that they say is basically animal food. That's why they use the term, because they're not aware of this. Uh, and also, as they want to say, this is, the, mind you, this is the key find is a summary part of the big report. These foods here says counteract the effects of anti-nutrients found in plant-based foods. They're reacting to the idea that uh, I think particularly because of me, because I spoke to the FAO myself, I was invited to speak there, um, and uh, they're very much very conscious of uh, what our China study has been doing. So they now want to talk about the anti-nutrients in plant foods. Of course, if you take certain things out of plant foods, you know you might find they're not exactly desirable. 
but not the normal food without the pesticides, herbicides, and so forth and so on. They say basically what they're saying here is that these animal foods counteract the effects of this. This again is just sure play on our words. And then the worst of all, these animal foods, so they say, can have effects on NCDs, which are not, it's the heart disease, cancer, diabetes, immune function, broadly, and even, broad. I mean, I, I, I wish I could have four foot lectures in this case here, but all of this here stuff is taking advantage of the public not knowing nutrition. Uh, and they're putting together this major, major report for all the countries around the world to use to put in their national guidelines. So um, I want to turn to your thoughts to just one more thing. Uh, so I, I'm at the point right now, we we simply don't need animal food, in spite of the fact that's the way I was raised, uh, in spite of the fact that I was doing a doctorate dissertation to promote it, uh, I live by science. I live by science. And that's why I showed you in the first place, because science to me is, is a really is an amazing sort of concept uh, where, by which uh, we can have different opinions, of course, uh, but we have to get together and then trade ideas. And then in that course of trading ideas, um, uh, we uh, get whatever we might conclude. We submit a book publication. We get reviewed by professionals and then eventually gets published if it's done right. Anyhow, so no, no protein. There's a second thing here that I said it has to do with this concept of whole food. Here's what I want to, brought, you know, I want to develop this thesis here uh, this way. This is a chart of uh, reaction going on in cells, all cells, plant and animals, the charts in cells uh, that is capturing the energy from the sun. All of the energy comes from sun, by the way. Um, and it all comes in, by the way, of plants, not animals. It comes in, by the way, of plants. So the plants capture the energy. And then the whole series of reactions going on here. This is called the glycolysis cycle, the Krebs cycle down here. And, and so it's sort of managed step by step by step all the way through here, kind of peeling off little bits of energy here and there. And this, this is fairly fundamental biochemistry. I taught this about 50 years ago myself. It was very exciting at that time. It wasn't quite as complicated as this, it was a little simpler, but uh, it, was, it was all quite exciting um, to see that the energy we get for our lives comes from plants, only plants, and then it's gradually extracted down through the course of all these reactions. These, this energy is picked off and sent here, there, and every place to serve our bodies. So that's, that's basically the energy cycle. Then it turned to this, and now 10 times worse. It, it, that simple reaction, and just in the years of, during my career, has now grown so immensely, as they say, it's 100 times what I was uh, looking at in the 1960s. So here's, here's the base, I call it. Uh, and so uh, a, a drug, to make a drug, uh, is, it, it, the idea is there to find one reaction um, to uh, create a chemical to block it, if you will, uh, and uh, that's, that is the drug industry. In fact, it's like one among many. That's why there's so many side effects. You can just imagine uh, for a foreign chemical to come in with, with uh, oftentimes uh, quite toxic, to come in the cell and find one thing that's going to solve our problems with, with our disease, it makes no sense, no sense. On the other hand, the food protocol, you got multiple nutrients with no side effects really, when they're consumed through food, uh, just addressing all these at the same time. That's really what it's doing. I'm jumping ahead and not, not defending my proposition very well, but in any case, uh, there's the two what means of improving human health and controlling problems. We can either use drugs, one reaction at a time, get side effects. Thirdly, you cause the subs, or we can use food without side effects and just eat food. There could not be more dramatic in a sense. So now I'm going to show you here this repeat of this chart. I simplified it down a little bit here, if you will. In this case here, I'm going to talk about a real event, how this occurred. Um, cholesterol, as you all know, has long been considered to be uh, a cause of heart disease. It's not, by the way. Um, it, it's an indicator of heart disease, yes. Uh, but the cholesterol we consume doesn't necessarily relate to that. So the idea arose during the 70s and 80s or so, especially during the 80s, that if we could find in this, in this chain of reactions, the source of cholesterol, maybe we had blocked the production of cholesterol because we thought cholesterol causes heart disease, 
we can block it in some way. So they found eventually it worked out the biochemical mechanisms for forming cholesterol. And it goes through a series of steps here, comes from this compound called acetyl-CoA, uh, from the center place, but in any case, it comes from here, or serum cholesterol. And so they found a place, they find one of these steps in here where uh, you know a drug might block it. And they said, wow, that's great. Now we can block cholesterol and get, get heart disease. So simple-minded. Uh, and here we have SEDS. Now, what is it, a $26 or $27 billion industry? And in, in, it's incredible. And it, really, the evidence, if you look at the evidence of statins, I've looked at quite a lot of that. At best, it might reduce heart disease by 9%. Uh, a lot of them don't show any effect at all, and it has side effects. So that's what we live with. Here's another example of living with this idea of uh, working with drugs. That starts with Nixon's 1974 or 71 more cancer. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, the idea at, in that war of cancer was to uh, really put a concentrated effort in synthesizing chemicals to to, uh, to uh, control cancer, reverse cancer, to treat cancer, if you will. Uh, that was 71. Uh, 30 years later, uh, no, in 2071, yeah, in 2004, um, there was, we then, by that time, had a lot of data on a lot of cancer patients who had died of cancer, uh, stored here in the United States, especially. And uh, so they went back in 2004, some researchers did, Australians in this case, Australians and Americans, but they went back and, and looked at all that data, hundreds of thousands of subjects, and, and representing 22 different cancers. And they looked at the drugs that they, people were taking, and then determined uh, uh, you know, how effective they were by indicating their effect on five-year survival. You know, all those drugs basically uh, as, actually increased five-year survival by only 2.1%. That's the cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs that have been used all this time. Besides, many of them, are, they cause cancer themselves. That's what we've lived with in the cancer field for 30 years. That's really a very damaging uh, information. And many of these chemo, chemo drugs cause cancer themselves. The average cost in 2014 is much higher now. It's over a billion dollars, well over a billion dollars, probably a couple of billion by now, to make one cytotoxic chemotherapy drug. Can you imagine? They don't work. And they're good business. Great, great, good, great business. How many of us know? Here's one more example of this idea of working on the single things, like the single drug or single nutrient, if you will. I found this really interesting. This was published in 1981. Uh, at the time, I've got to move a chart away from here. You can maybe see it. Uh, in 1981. And what, what these researchers had done at that time uh, was uh, they looked at the relationship between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. And here's a three-way chart, if, you, if I can show it this way. Um, and what they did along this axis here, they got the the, uh, the amount of smoking occurred and it divided up these people that they had in the study into those who did not smoke, those who smoked for less than 30 years and those who smoked more than 30 years. And you can see here with this, this more than 30 years, they're the ones who got the lung cancer for the most part. But then they added one more thing to this group. They just sort of uh, determined, I don't know why they wanted to do this, but they determined uh, in, in this group here, uh, how much uh, beta carotene we're consuming. And you can see that it's here. And so the higher the beta carotene, in this case, most I've got problems with my, right, the higher the beta carotene, smoking, uh, in deaths from smoking cancer went down dramatically. These are in people, all of whom are heavy smokers, all of whom are heavy, or at least smoking for more than 30 years. And the more, those who consume more beta carotene, look at that, really impressive, dose response relationship, can't get much better than that. Now, beta carotene, as you know, is from plants. So what they're really doing was measuring plant consumption. Not all that great, probably, but enough that causes a dramatic decrease in, uh, in uh, lung cancer. Then they went on to, beyond that, said, this is exciting. Maybe beta carotene, maybe if we could develop the beta carotene into a pill and give it to these smokers, we could... Uh, you know, reduce lung cancer risk. So this study here was organized, I'm going to describe in a moment, uh, just did, uh, did a study, this was Finnish and American researchers. Uh, they had a total of 29,000 male smokers 
and they wanted to follow him up for eight years because they they thought that it was going to take eight years to see the effect on lung cancer. And actually, they saw some effects in short as five years and had to quit the study. Their, their hypothesis was that beta carotene would actually, the previous chart showed, would decrease the lung cancer. What they found was uh, in this study, they were able to calculate food uh, beta carotene intake, reflection of plant foods, of course. Uh, what In five years' time, they found that, yes, just like the other study did, it decreased lung cancer and was statistically significant just within five years. But the people taking the beta carotene supplement increased lung cancer by also significant increase, just the opposite. This demonstration here, I was at the time uh, very much involved in some of this, this kind of activity. Uh, I just found it staggering. In fact, I had served at the, uh, the wishes of the National Academy of Science and in the court hearings on claims being made about supplements. Uh, and I became aware of this at the time. And uh, supplements, bottom line, supplements don't work like they do in food. The nutrients in supplements do not work like they, like they do in food. In fact, they're really problematic, can be the reverse. It may, in the first uh, short period of time, a few months, a year, or something like that, look like they're doing something good. No, long range, that's no supplements are no substitute for uh, food. I call food holism uh, and uh, use the supplements reductionism. In other words, holism, everything working together. That's nutrition. Reductionism, which is the feature of the entire, our entire medical system, is drugs. So holism is a reflection of food. Or nutrition, reduction of the reflection of working on one nutrient at a time, one cause, one one drug, if you will, one supplement, and maybe not, this doesn't really work. Here's some more examples. I've watched this uh, evidence accumulate over the years, and here's some things that uh, are kind of ignored, but they're published. Uh, vitamin E increases the hemorrhagic stroke by 74%. That's another example of what I'm talking about. Calcium and vitamin D increases. You can see here these. These things here. Now, now, there's a lot more evidence of this kind of thing that doesn't get publicized very much because the supplement industry would be upset, quite frankly. Um, I just see this leading to a second, prob a second uh, proposition. Namely, eat plants. Yes, stay with plants as much as you can. The better, the better, the more you do that, the better it gets because if you stay with the plants, just eat only that. I know that a lot of people find that difficult, but if you stay with it for at least two, maybe three months, we've got really good data on that, by the way. If you stay on that, that that period of time, your body tastes have changed. You don't want to go back. So you're giving your chance, you're giving your body a chance to, to actually become accustomed to this food you might not want, want them to have used. And by that time, you love food, uh, your health changes, cholesterol's down, and, and all these good things begin to happen. So I talk about nutrition being a holistic concept, multiple nutrients in the food working together, hundreds of thousands and more, multiple mechanisms for each nutrient, uh, a whole host of diseases. I mean, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, thyroid problems, whatever. They all seem to respond to varying degrees to the same proposition. Eating plants, you know, a good variety, uh, and uh, and then not adding back a lot of uh, substances like salt, sugar, and fat. Uh, that those are not real plants, obviously. Uh, we got become accustomed to that because those three things, salt, sugar, and fat, actually are uh, enhanced taste, according to most people. And but the problem is, you know, a little bit here and there. I suppose you can't say it's and it's going to definitely cause problem, but we we tend to use more and more, and we become addicted to the taste. <laughs>